of Europe. <clears throat> and due to the magic self-timer on this incredibly expensive camera, um, I am able to seemingly appear in front of you as though by magic, when in fact it is merely the most simple photographic trick mastered in the 19-teens of this century by enterprising filmmakers who discovered that if you stopped the film, stood in front of the camera, then it would appear as though you, um, in fact, appear in front of the camera as if by magic. Anyway, you don't want to hear all this crap. What do you care? This uh, presentation is called Anti-Hero, um, and for a very good reason, since it consists largely, if not entirely, of um, comments that various major and some minor publications have made about the wrong hero over the course of his career. Now, before you dismiss this program as a mere, um, you know, a, 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 an exercise in self-indulgence by the wrong hero, please keep in mind that every video the wrong hero does is an exercise in self-indulgence. This is no mere exercise in self-indulgence. This is, in fact, a major exercise in self-indulgence. But anyway, I thought you'd get a kick out of reading what various uh, members of the national media have said. And so you will not be seeing me for quite a while since I will be showing you the magazine covers in which um, these reviews uh, are published. And uh, I'm sorry I couldn't get any online reviews um, off of the internet, but um, I'm afraid I don't have the capability to, uh, to, to do that on video. In fact, there's a lot on video that I don't have the capability of doing. Um, I should say in a technical note, as long as we're talking about the capabilities of the camera, which is so uncool, by the way. If you're ever on cable television or any television, the one thing you should always avoid saying or drawing attention to is the fact that you are, in fact, on television. I mean, it's just so uncool. You know what I'm saying? It's like... It's like going, hi mom, I'm on television. You know, like it's not perfectly obvious. Um, it's okay to say hello to your mother, by the way. I mean, she's the one you should be uh, saying hello to. If it weren't for her, where would you be, right? I mean, you could probably get along without a father. I mean, look at me. But, uh, you know, without a mother, yeah, it'd be pretty hard for you to, like, be scuffing your jackboots along the tarmac there, chief. So, uh, always acknowledge your mother. But anyway. I should say that this camera does have a self-timer, but it's the first time I've ever probably really used it. And I didn't realize that it turns off after like about a minute. So um, unfortunately, the illusion of uh, my having appeared magically before you was somewhat diminished by the fact that I did not know this. It also has a uh, negative positive switch. So that I can appear before you in stunning negative vision. And uh, like it's boring after a while though. Um, it also has a, uh, you know, the usual crap, um, shutter speed so that if you're uh, taking uh, photographs out of a moving train then you can uh, get all sorts of nice effects. Um, and, you know, it has a light, not light register. I always have it on the highest setting. It, um, and it gives it gives everything that eerie glow that I so love. For example, just look out the window here. With the light at the highest setting, it looks a little like that. Isn't that ridiculous? Look at all that snow. But if you reduce it to a more normal setting, then it becomes more obvious that I am, in fact, living very close to uh, what many would c consider to be extremely squalid conditions. Anyway, I prefer to shed more light on the subject, as it were. This camera also has a time-lapse function, but um, I, don't, I don't really have the patience to uh, sit here and do a time-lapse for you. So uh, you're not going to get the opportunity to see that. And um, let's see, it has a lens cap. And if you leave it on, then the picture will be totally blank. And um, well, that's about it. Um, you know, there's a date and time set, which I don't really use. Um, 
wow, there's this enormous bird out there. I wonder if I can get it on. Oh, shit. See, this always happens. You see something, but the very fact that you see it renders it, um, it changes the conditions under which you are. Um, but you wouldn't believe the size of that crow that was just out there. Oh, I'll show you the tracks that it left. And then I'll give you some idea of how big it was. I mean, that thing must have been feasting on roadkill for all eternity. Uh, really, I mean, this thing was huge. It was the size of a small dog. Not even a small dog, a medium size. Look at those tracks. I mean, just to give you some idea of how big it is. And this always happens, though, you know. It's a wonder that people ever even get to see anything on video because uh, things just, you know, don't stay very long. Anyway, um, I think I've, I've spoken enough, and so uh, I am going to uh, <clears throat> now bring to you um, <coughs> hey, I wonder if I have the wind sock on. Nope. I have it on normal wind. Um, yeah, let's see. What else we got here? Uh, that's about it. I think I pretty much um, told you all about all the swell features on this camera. By the way, this is Cafe Cabaret number 249. So the next Cafe Cabaret will be something of a landmark or a milestone in my career. Um, my companion show, Noise Party, has already exceeded the 250 mark, so I would just like you all to know that I have produced over 500 television shows for Cambridge Community Television, which means over 1,000 hours. Actually, I probably reached that mark about two or three months ago since um, at their inception, Cafe Cabaret and Noise Party were two hour and 40 minute shows. Um, at least Noise Party was, uh, but the uh, people over at CCTV didn't want to broadcast something that long, so um, we cut it back to two hours. In any event, um, now I present the wrong hero in Anti-Hero. The Advocate. Hero or Zero? The Wrong Hero, a so-called comedian based in Cambridge, Massachusetts, is raising heck on the local cable TV circuit. Although he is attired in a mask, quilted hat, and color-coordinated Liz Claiborne nightdress, his monologues tend to be scatological, misogynistic, and chock-full of bias and prejudicial statements. A little self-hatred, perhaps? It's time for Cambridge Community Television to take a good long look at the kind of values they're promoting on their broadcasts. American Journalism Review World Famous Obscurity Title The wrong hero, not known for his aversion to wretched excess, is currently dominating the market for topical humor on Tuesday Night Cable Access in Cambridge, Massachusetts, a city of 100,000 with a substantial student population provided by MIT and Harvard. If half the city gets cable and his, he manages to attract one-tenth of one percent of the audience, that means that at any given time his pathetic rantings are being watched by approximately 50 people. That makes him the ultimate cult, quote, hero, unquote, positioned in what is perhaps the world's smallest, quote, niche, unquote, market. Does he represent the wave of the future for topical humorists? Time will tell. At least he doesn't have to worry about offending the sensibilities of his corporate sponsors, for he has none, nor is he ever likely to. Furthermore, since, in his market, he competes against network favorites such as Home Improvement, Frasier, Coach, NYPD Blue, Cops, Star Trek, and Video Soul, 50 viewers a week is probably an overly generous assessment. American Demographics, title, Wrong Hero, Who Watches? Demographically speaking, the wrong hero reaches approximately two one hundred thousandths of a percentage point of all people in the United States, and of these, at least nine tenths of them tune out before the end of the two hours. As a result, by the time the 11 p.m. conclusion of the show rolls around, roughly five people in the entire country are watching, and nine tenths of them are not happy. By this time, younger viewers are in bed, and older viewers have dozed off, leaving a core viewership of one 39-year-old who would be watching if, in fact, 
he got cable television, which he doesn't. The wrong hero, an exercise in futility, you be the judge. The American Enterprise, title, Sidelights. A recent comment made by Wrong Hero fan Phil Berliner quotes him as saying, the aim of the wrong hero is to, quote, create pod people, unquote. The American Prospect, a journal for the liberal imagination. Devil in the Details, title. Remember the wrong hero? Probably not, unless you're based in Cambridge. Even then, since losing his weekly show at the Middle East and Central Square and being barred for life from Club Bohemia in Inman Square, his so toehold on the comedy scene are his monthly appearances at AS220 in Providence and at Cafe Liberty in Central Square. Even there, he is a prophet without honor, in much the same way as liberals in Congress are. At a recent show at the Middle East, the wrong hero gave a presidential campaign speech and was pelted with coins, drum heads, and hard candy. And later that evening, a member of the audience threw a can of Ensure at him. In retaliation, he damaged the headlining band's musical equipment, and a fist fight very nearly broke out as a result. Not a promising portent for the wrong hero's hopes for presidential election in 1996. But par for the course. The American Spectator, a monthly journal edited by R. Emmett Tyrrell, Jr. Editorial. The apparent success, <clears throat> or lack thereof, of the wrong hero continues to disconcert humor aficionado's weekly face with his insufferable delusions and cursory botched presentations. Devoid of talent, it is doubtful the wrong hero's motivation for continuing his sesquipedalian rants will ever be explained to anyone's satisfaction. Asia Week. The Illustrated Prophecies. 2065. The collected works of the wrong hero and Finnegan's Wake are finally translated into Chinese. The Atlantic Monthly, Section 745 Boylston Street. In retrospect, we may look at the blighted career of the wrong hero as one in which enormous promise was held in equal balance with the incompetent squandering of that self-same creative potential. Business Week, Section Upfront. Mixed record for a cable access upstart wrong hero show, Cafe Cabaret, in fifth year and 249th episode, which has been consistently ranked last against shows like NECN's Primetime with Roy Harves and Lila Orbach, The Family Channel's Rescue 911, and The 700 Club, as well as CNN's Larry King Live and World News Tonight. Even Frontline and Nova managed to outdraw the wrong hero in the Tuesday 9 p.m. time slot. Campaigns and Elections, the magazine for political professionals. Section, Potpourri. Polls show the wrong hero losing the New Hampshire primary by the largest margin in recorded history. He not only receives no votes, but the polling agency reports receiving harassing phone calls from disgruntled respondents far into the night. Columbia Journalism Review, section Darts and Laurels. Dart to the wrong hero of Cambridge Community Television, Channel 55 in Cambridge, Massachusetts, for droning on at interminable length for no discernible purpose save to bolster his own ego. In a recent program, he reads off bogus, quote, reviews, unquote, of his show without identifying them as such. Apparently, he never once considered the issue of whether impressionable viewers would be unduly influenced by his controversial and biased fabrications. Furthermore, when showing a cover of our magazine, he consistently kept flipping the negative and positive on and off, creating a highly distracting and very nearly surreal effect which we found most disconcerting. 
Common Cause Magazine, People, Power, and Politics in Washington. Section, Just the Facts. Number of broadcast hours per week CCTV gives to the producer of the Wrong Hero program? Four. Percentage of those four hours devoted exclusively to the Wrong Hero? Fifty. Source? The Wrong Hero. Commentary. Letter to the editor. Why do you even bother mentioning the Wrong Hero in your publication? What has he ever said about the Holocaust? What has he ever done for the state of Israel? Signed, name withheld by request. Commonweal. Media section. Title, The Snide Lecturer. If the wrong hero is a, quote, comedian, unquote, then the Pope is a, quote, heathen, unquote, and his latest encyclical is a, quote, skit, unquote, on the popular television show, quote, Saturday Night Live, unquote. Here's what we have to say about the wrong hero, Colin. Watch him and be damned. Consequences. The nature and implications of environmental change. Editorial. We welcome suggestions for improving our magazine, but we'd like to suggest that the masked man who keeps faxing us pictures and messages which read microwave earthy find something more constructive to do with his time. Daedalus, Journal of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. Preface. Because nobody predicted the wrong hero would be able to sustain his outlandish antics for 100 programs, no copies were made of his work, save a few crude kinescopes. And unlike Jackie Gleason, who kept his classic Honeymooners sketches in an air-conditioned vault in Florida, unquote, the wrong hero stored his forgettable output in a moldy basement in Providence, Rhode Island, the mildew capital of the world. Thus, it is little short of miraculous that anything any record of his work survived at all. How he will be regarded by posterity, it is difficult to know. If he will have a posterity, it is not for us to say. Whether he is even fully aware of the exact meaning of the word posterity is highly doubtful. We, for one, do not propose to ask him. For once, we must conclude that there are some things we are better off not knowing. Descent. The last page. Since nobody cares about what an aging deadbeat like the wrong hero has to say, why does he bother? What is his reason d'etre for his pro bono work which benefits no one but himself? And even that is doubtful. I'd like to make a decidedly modest proposal. Sic transit gloria mundi. After all, ars longa vita brevis. And, most of all, ipso facto quel dommage. Therefore, shut up. Dollars and cents. What's left in economics? Section, the short run. Title, CCTV renews the wrong hero. As of January 2nd, 1996, CCTV in Cambridge has renewed the Wrong Hero program for another year. CCTV contends that since he paid his $10 yearly fee, he is entitled to broadcast anything he likes. The first full-length Wrong Hero feature aired January 2nd, 1992. But as early as 1990, the Wrong Hero had been using his so-called sense of humor and dubious intellect to stir up trouble for no good reason except to attract attention to himself. Quote, get out of my face, unquote, the wrong hero said to us. Quote, I don't need no publicity from the likes of you, unquote. We ignored him, and so does everybody else. The Drug Policy Letter, editorial. Drugs can often bring out the very worst in people. 
That is why they are illegal. But the wrong hero always brings out the worst in people. A pity that no one can outlaw him. Of course, if he were outlawed, he could be sold for $20 a gram. And if he could be sold for $20 a gram, he'd currently have a street value of $135,000. The Ecologist. Section, Green Screen and Print. The Wrong Hero's forthcoming magnum opus, The World Without an Earth Shall Be, scheduled for an April 30th broadcast on CCTV Channel 55, Tuesday night at 9 p.m., looks like it might be intriguing. Unfortunately, the copy he sent us for review had no soundtrack, but presumably his project will repay the attention of environmentalists and their misguided foes alike. E, the environmental magazine. E notes. Title, Speaking Out, Notes from the Man Who Sold the World. The wrong hero, alien comedian, intends to auction off the planet Earth to the highest bidder. In today's beleaguered environmental environment, this is a welcome sign since cleanup projects will presumably now commence in much the same way as you vacuum the rugs of your 1986 Hyundai before you sell it. However, there is a question as to the authenticity of the deed written in crayon and three different colors of ink, which the wrong hero claims gives him title to the planet. Questions? Call 617-354-3146. The Economist. Section, The Economist Review of Books and Multimedia. The wrong hero a comedian Mank from Cambridge, Massachusetts, USA, performs a thankless chore in bringing his insights, as it were, to a television audience every week. But if you know even the most elementary facts about him, you will quickly come to realize that, ele mycenary impulses notwithstanding, the most important thing to keep in mind about the wrong hero is simply this. The wrong hero is a crazy fool and he's talking stupid nonsense. What's more, he's dull, and in a magazine published in Great Britain and devoted to the most arcane details of global economics, this is a most damning charge. Perhaps the future holds great things for the wrong hero, but we would just as soon back Nick Leeson, the fellow who broke Baring's bank by speculating none too presciently on Japanese derivatives. For Unlike the hapless stockbroker, whose name has become a byword for hubris, leading inevitably to utter catastrophe, the wrong hero has no redeeming qualities whatsoever. Environment Magazine Commentary Not unlike drums of toxic chemicals buried beneath school playgrounds and maternity hospitals, the wrong hero is a time bomb hidden in what seems, at least at first, to be a safe, wholesome environment. Far Eastern Economic Review, section Traveler's Tales. The wrong hero, self-styled comedian from the United States, got the shock of his life in a Chinese restaurant in Beijing when he ordered item number 14 on the menu. In China, the number 14 translates to mean definite death. First things. Section, while we're at it. Our most respected church historians dread the presence of the wrong hero who, since an early age, has mocked all religions and has made a point of defiling every sanctum sanctorum he could reach with his grubby hands. But one old priest who taught him his high school Latin begs to differ. Quote, at least he cares, unquote, bragged the boastful prelate, quote, 
at least he still cares. Unquote. Forbes magazine. 1995's 40 Bottom Money Entertainers section. At the very bottom of the list for 1995 was The Wrong Hero, who spent $12 on diesel fuel and $166 on videotape, leaving him with net expenses of $178 balanced against net earnings of zero. Plus, if you were to take the amount of time he spent producing the videos and multiply it by the minimum wage, The Wrong Hero actually spent some $3,000 producing these videos and he received in return zero dollars. This makes him our number 40th worst entertainer. Forbes Media Critic, the best and worst of America's journalism. Section from the editor. Discussions of the wrong hero frequently take on a conspiratorial tone, and it is true that, as a, quote, McCarthy of the left, unquote, the wrong hero has proven himself utterly beholden to the liberal media in general and to the extremely, me extremely liberal Cambridge Community Television in particular. But it was not until he launched an ill-considered attack on this very magazine that we so much as deign to take notice of his malicious, gap-toothed antics. And now, having mentioned him this one time, let us return to our work of pointing out what's right about conservatism, ably assisted, as always, by our team of distinguished and highly credentialed contributors, many of whom went to the same college as the wrong hero. And we really wish he wouldn't do this to our magazine. It makes us look foolish for him to continually put it on black and white, black and white like that. Myself, Christopher Caldwell in particular, do not enjoy this treatment. Fortune, Editor's Desk, Section, Title, Hell of a Hero. Broke as he is, the wrong hero never ceases to amaze us with his grizzled insights, as stupendously wrong as they are. He has the rare gift of making even surefire topics seem dull as stale toast. My advice to those he has done dirt to? He is not even worth the effort of stepping on. Freedom Review, Section Free Comment Theoretically, the wrong hero is a threat to everyone's freedom, but because he is his own worst enemy and the world's most persecuted minority, perhaps we should feel sorry for him. We say he is his own worst enemy. It is as though he is attempting to defiantly prove he is his own worst enemy, for he hands out pamphlets with his picture on it, which declare, this is the face of the enemy. We cannot help but have pity for a man who is so persecuted that he even persecutes himself. The Futurist, Section, Lifestyles, Title, Just Plain Wrong. In the future, says the wrong hero, Medical science will say the wrong hero suffered from a manic depressive syndrome which could have easily been cured if medical science had been sufficiently advanced. We hate to tell him, but he's wrong. Medical science is sufficiently advanced. He's just too cheap and ornery to seek the psychi psychiatric help he so desperately and obviously needs. Nevertheless, it is encouraging that the wrong hero thinks of the future at all, if, even if only in terms of himself and nothing else. Let's hope others follow his lead.
Gallup Poll Monthly. Good news. The wrong hero sees the U.S. as a land of diminishing opportunity, and since he's known for being always wrong, this means conditions will pick up sooner than we can imagine if they haven't already by the time this issue reaches the newsstand. Harper's Magazine Index Number of times the wrong hero has sent us a parody of Harper's Index? One. Chances we'll ever print anything the wrong hero sends us? Zero. The Harris Poll. Tim Allen, still America's favorite TV personality. Wrong hero, least popular comic ever. Many prefer oral surgery, watching paint dry, being lost in wilderness. Harvard Magazine, section, The College Pump. The Yale man said at the urinal to the wrong hero, class of 79, quote, at Yale, we wash our hands after emptying our bladders, unquote. To which the wrong hero replied, quote, at Harvard, ah, fuck you. Unquote. Hispanic Magazine, section, uh, Hispanic Agenda, title, What Will the Wrong Hero Do for Hispanics? Nothing. He knows nothing of our language, our culture, our heritage. He is a big bendejo. His shows are an ala putrida of half-digested fears, hatreds, and prejudices. Our advice to you is to forget we ever mentioned him. Human Events, the National Conservative Weekly. Section, The Right Ear. Title, Hero Outrageously Distorts GOP Record. Not since the days when President Reagan hung on our every word have we heard such distortions from a supposedly impartial individual. The heartless charge against conservatives is totally unfounded. After all, sometimes it's cruel to be kind. And why should we pay any attention to the wrong hero? He doesn't wear a suit and tie. He's against the death penalty. And worst of all, he sneers contemptuously at everything that crosses in front of his beady eyes. There is little he can do to halt the GOP revolution, but there is a lot our elected officials can do to curb the types of cable access shows that broadcast such un-American garbage. <clears throat> God speed the day. A prominent politician who did not wish to be quoted directly stated, the only purpose that we should allow the wrong hero into Washington, D.C. is to put him in prison or to hang him. Once again, we say, God speed the day. It will not be permitted for the wrong hero to accuse us of charges of cruelty any longer. In these times, section, Apollo meter, title, The Hysterical Illusion of Power, rating on a scale of 1 to 10, 6.66. Since January 9, 1991, the wrong hero has been broadcasting outright his hate speech on a weekly basis, owing to a loophole in the FCC rules governing the content of cable access programming. According to the wrong hero, he stands for, quote, sex, fear, hedonism, and irresponsibility, unquote. Meanwhile, more political programming doesn't air on Cambridge Community Television because the wrong hero dominates the Tuesday 9 o'clock p.m. time slot, discouraging others from utilizing the public airwaves by giving political activism a bad name. India Today, section, Voices. Good timey alienation and cynical idealism is all very well and good, but freedom can become mere anarchy and self-indulgence 
like that of the wrong hero, taken too far, can become a recipe for failure. That is why I do not care if the Muslims declare a fatwa on the wrong hero. If he cannot respect those who are God-gifted, then how can we respect him? Soon he will be cut to size, for those who he selfishly offends are very vindictive. J.A.M.A., the Journal of the American Medical Association. The wrong hero manifests both abnormal left and abnormal right frontal forebrain response, as well as severely restricted regional cerebral blood flow, leading us to suspect that his predisposition to experience distortions in his neural correlates is the cause of his, as of yet, unclassified behavioral dysfunction. McLean's, Canada's weekly news magazine. The wrong hero, our neighbor to the south, though not from Canada, has visited and committed crimes in our country, and he should heartily congratulate himself on his good fortune at escaping detection, because here in Canada, we don't hold with the sentimental dreck that his problems all stem from a tragic childhood. The glitzy and boozy city of Boston may be willing to put up with him, but we like our country with its low crime rate and law-abiding citizenry the way it is, and we will tolerate no disrespect for the rule of law here in Canada. And we will advise the wrong here that what he is doing to the cover of our magazine is highly illegal and he would be liable to be brought up on charges if he were to ever set foot across the border of the United States into Canada. Media Studies Journal. Title, Definitive Questions. Journalists may quarrel, but among them is universal agreement on one basic fact. As ironically unpopular as media is in general, the wrong hero is more unpopular still. Mother Jones, Editor's Note. Any attempt by the wrong hero or anyone like him to dominate a media market, howsoever niche-oriented, is doomed to end in failure. The wrong hero violates all of the secular and sacred credos on which this country was founded. Paradoxically, his negativity is highly attractive to just those Americans who ought to know better. However, it must be remembered that the wrong hero's pseudo-populist iconoclasm is nothing more than a showy mask for mere charlatanism. What's more, it is snake oil of a particularly unsavory kind, the elitist kind. The Nation Media Matters There is more to the wrong hero than self-serving revanchism. Not since Stalin have we seen an individual so ready to put his poster up on every corner. The National Enquirer Headline Space Alien Gives Campaign Speech for Cambridge Mayor Ken Reeves Quote that fool is the whole reason I wasn't elected for a third term, unquote. So says two-term Cambridge Mayor Ken Reeves after losing 8-1 to one in a Cambridge City Council mayoral contest. National Minority Politics Magazine, a different viewpoint on national issues. The fact that the wrong hero claims to be, quote, a minority of one, makes this black American, at least, resentful. When he proclaims that all the entitlements should go to him, I see red. But at least he has a point, unlike the poverty pests he parrots. Individuals like the wrong hero are living proof that some people just aren't fit to mingle with regular folks. It is sad but true. If you measured the content of his character, it would be like emptying the ocean with a thimble. Neither task is possible, for, just as the ocean is virtually limitless, the wrong hero is practically devoid 
of human characteristics. National Review, section on the right. We may suppose, passe the wrong hero, that politics is sports for people who are too fat to run, but personages of girth are no pushovers. And again, to cite the wrong hero, who is no victim of anorexia nervosa himself, a man who is ipso facto plump and knows it, is ipso facto and ipso fatso obese. But let us no longer talk of such things. It is really quite cruel, and I need a drink. The New Democrat, section, short takes. Fed up with ranting right-wing demagogues? Take a lesson from the wrong hero and fight fire with arson. Mock them so skillfully that before long, nobody is sure what you believe, which, in our book, makes him a Democrat by inclination. The New Leader, section, Between Issues. To most Americans, the name The Wrong Hero means nothing. In spite of their ignorance, we think they're probably right. New Perspectives Quarterly. Media the world over has ruptured generations. Nowhere is this more clear than in one generation's loathing of and the previous generation's complete rejection of the wrong hero. The New Republic, section, notebook. We don't have much nice to say about the wrong hero or about anything else. So now you know. New Statesman and Society, section Fortiana. A man in mask and dress has, since November of 1990, consistently managed to produce two to five hours of video programming every week. And nobody in the town of Cambridge, Massachusetts, finds this odd or seems to think it is worth commenting about. Newsweek, section Periscope. Just how crazy is the hero? A Manhattan psychiatrist told Newsweek that the wrong hero himself is beginning to doubt his own sanity, which is, he avers, a heartening symptom of recovery. Despite the wrong hero's assurance that he will continue his broadcasts at least into 1997, many feel as though his days on cable access are numbered. The wrong hero himself declined to comment. Newsweek, letter to the editor. I'll get you, you filthy monkeys, signed the wrong hero. The New York Review of Books, title, Restless Ecstasy. In 1957, the wrong hero fled his exploding planet. His only regret? He should have used less dynamite and set a longer fuse. Since the wrong hero has refused to give us permission to quote from his writings, we'll have to refer you to his autobiography. This is not a book. Go on, beat it, scram, fetch the red hot branding iron, part one and its sequel. So you didn't listen. Now you must be sacrificed. The New York Times Book Review, section Books in Brief. Review. Tinabgo Bisgu Fitter Hibipo. In the fastness of New England's most haunted and hag-ridden recesses resides a self-styled alien who calls himself the wrong hero. His amusing anecdotes form the bulk of his memoir, with the vast majority of them citing adverse reviews of his performances and snide commentaries on his long-running television series. We cannot recommend his book this is not a book, go on, beat it, scram, fetch the red-hot branding iron, 
part one at all. However, we do prefer it to Howard Stern's book, currently number two on our New York Times book review list. The New York Times Magazine advertisement. This page, Louise Vuitton luggage being stolen by an eccentric in a mask and dress who calls himself the wrong hero, $695. Filthy, tattered Liz Clyborne dress worn by the wrong hero, 45 cents. The New Yorker, section, the talk of the town. If you haven't been in Cambridge since the blizzard of 77, you may be aware that sophisticated hero around town and masked avenger, the wrong hero, has been driving competing oddballs into neighboring suburbs for no matter how bizarre their peculiar ticks, mumbles, whistles, murmurs, or gesticulations may be, they are no match for those of the soy, the soy saw alien being who calls himself the wrong hero, who incidentally, is the associate editor of a publication out of Boston entitled The Noise. However, there is one man who now hangs out on the Cambridge subway, the Red Line subway system based in Harvard Square, who insists on singing the song Calendar Girl in an extremely parched voice and who recently was observed as saying to a hapless subway patron seated waiting for the train at 11 p.m. at night, I'll give you karate lessons, $50. $50 an hour, karate lessons. So in that way, perhaps the return of eccentrics to the Cambridge scene is a sign of the diminishing influence of the wrong hero. The noise. Rock around Boston. The crowd is braced to either carry the band home on their shoulders or send them to a private one on one with the wrong hero. Issue number 149, April of 1995. Noise, issue number 150. Title. The Wrong Hero Blithers and Blathers About Mickey Bliss, written by The Wrong Hero. The Wrong Hero and Mickey Bliss, our stories are extricably intertwined, fortunately for me. Here, my aim is to give you every scandalous detail of the rise of the man known as Mickey Bliss. Fortunately for him, however, there are laws in this country against libel and slander, and he is a lawyer. But perhaps through the judicious application of thinly veiled innuendo and artfully chosen weasel words, I can churn out a soft-hitting, holds-barred expose of the life and times of, a.k.a. not his real name, Mickey Bliss. Modesty prohibits me from mentioning how, on March 4th, 1992, I got Mickey Bliss his first gig in over a year. Common decency prevents me from mentioning how I practically bullied him into taking up the Hammond organ for his Middle East debut. My reluctance to relentlessly promote myself forbids me from chronicling the tale of how, right after he joined the Modniks, the wrong hero emceed a show with them, Dennis James, and the Mickey Bliss organ combo at the Ranch House in Marshfield, an airplane hangar-sized roadhouse patronized largely by overstuffed rum-dumb hayseeds and their big-haired South Shore doxies. This show was a dry run. Naturally, I'm too shy to tell you how, <clears throat> after the Modniks wrangled the regular gig at the Kirkland Cafe, right off of Beacon Street near the Somerville Cambridge line, the Rock Hero emceed their first and a dozen subsequent shows at what was eventually to become Club Bohemia. A certain gentlemanly reticence prevents me from revealing that, as jaded scenesters watched in awe and pity, the wrong hero was eventually hounded off that very same stage by a fickle mob of filth-encrusted, lice-infested townies whose sole intellectual activity consisted of twiddling their non-opposable thumbs amid bouts of pissing away their old age pensions with an over-brimming slop jar of old pop skull clutched in each 
fat, sweaty fist. Do I dare to mention that nowadays Mickey Bliss in MSCs regularly not only at Club Bohemia but also at the Middle East Bakery? Should I add that to top his list of recent triumphs, all gained almost entirely at my expense? He's also listed as the trumpeter on No Luggage Allowed, the B-side of the Modnik's newly released second single. You ask, why did the great and all-powerful wrong hero permit this to happen? Let us examine the background of Mr. Mickey Bliss in Alias and see if we can uncover some answers. Mickey Bliss was born on December 9, 1951, the very same day as the publisher of the periodical you now hold in your hands. In the far distant future, Post-primate brain hominids reading this may slap their pointy, ovoid heads with slender, spidery appendages and telepathically exclaim, Slithering tree slugs, or holy spotted owls, or even great horny toads, but I seriously doubt it. Italians are well known for smothering their toe-headed moppets with head-spinning dollops of over-affectionate attention. My family was half Polish and threatened to send me to camp, a nice little work camp in Bavaria. 1956. Even as Elvis Presley was gorging himself on ice cream sundaes and underage groupies were lining up at his door with deli slips bearing numbers, five-year-old Mickey Bliss was wowing Paisano and kinfolk alike with Elvis impressions, holding a guitar he could neither tune nor play, much like Elvis himself. In 1958, his bid to be the next Satchmo or Miles was thwarted when his newly acquired braces interfered with his trumpet lessons. At that time, I was a drooling tot who alarmed my parents by refusing to eat except from the dog's dish. In 1960, as any schoolboy knows, rock music all but vanished for three years and was replaced by ghastly white bread slush and insipid dance crazes. I didn't care. I was into the sliding doors that preceded each episode of my favorite Popeye cartoons. In 1963, this was beginning to change. First came The Kingsman with Louie Louie, a song that was supposed to be obscene but was merely incomprehensible. Mickey Bliss was going to junior high school dances and listening to the Beatles going, yeah, 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 and sharing other unique insights with us. And on his 14th birthday, instead of, instead of a subscription to National Geographic, he got a folk guitar, which he immediately tried to tune and ended up breaking instead. Even then, Roger McGuinn was forming the birds. Are you following this? In 1966, the animals had a hit with, We've Got to Get Out of This Place. Inspired by its ominously foreshortened bass line, Doom, 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 Mickey bought a Japanese guitar on the cheap and eventually, arming himself with a Play Along with the Ventures LP, learned how to belt out crowd pleasers like Pipeline and Wipeout. Soon thereafter, he and a bunch of buddies formed a psychedelic group called Fog. At a 1967 battle of the bands in Rockland, Massachusetts, playing a set of all originals, unheard of at the time, they came in dead last. In the bargain, they got pelted with pennies, marbles, and super balls before they had even played a note. Even so, it might have been an even worse experience if the band had trotted out their eardrum ear ear, ear scorching rendition of the Velvet Underground's heroin. Two years pass. Mickey takes up the blues, drops out of UMass Amherst, goes to Berkeley, and takes a job at Jack's drum shop. The owner, swamped in debt, skips town. At age 22, Mer Mickey drops out of Berkeley and finds himself running and living in Jack's drum shop for two and a half years, sitting pretty, sitting in with soul bands, playing drums in strip joints. But then the creditors finally foreclose, he loses the shop, and in the summer of 1975, Mickey Bliss becomes the floor man, and later MC, at the Combat Zone's notorious 2 o'clock lounge, where the wrong hero once blew $20 in 20 minutes buying watered-down drinks for an apathetically indifferent prostitute. Mickey Bliss lasts there for a year and a half, then moves to the East Village in New York City, just in time to play in punk rock bands for a few months. Then, it's off to San Francisco and a job as a nightclub barker. At about the same time, I was roaming the Embarcadero with nary a nickel in my pocket. It's even possible our paths crossed. 
Mickey gets into gospel music, teaches himself piano, buys half interest in a nightclub, sells it back a month later, then sets sail for Hawaii. In September of 1978, he finds himself a job peddling Japanese tourists, their fists dripping with fuck you money, across and around the scenic islands on a rickshaw. He even finds time to manage a massage parlor and practice his guitar. Our hero is now 28. He moves back in with his parents and becomes an English major, a real ticket to oblivion, at UMass Boston. Mickey, Mission of Burma have yet to play their first gig. Mickey hangs out at the Rap, the Space, the Underground, and Cantones, the latter a closet-shaped dive the size of a large dressing room, ill-lit and indescribably filthy, where once the wrong hero got kicked during a vitamin show for drunkenly assaulting patrons with a filthy toilet plunger. Mickey Bliss forms the optics which goes from pistols like punk to cars like new wave all in nine months and then disbands. Fresh from playing bass in the optics, Mickey teams up with blues man Dennis James and plays guitar, then organ, then organ and bass simultaneously. Eventually this ensemble forms the nucleus of the Mickey Bliss Band. In June of 81 he graduates from college and five months later forms Hitman Records and releases Venus Dressed in Plastic Garbage backed with Trapezoid. The A-side is an atmospheric semi-spoken word piece that gets good reviews but little airplay. Around this time the Mickey Bliss Band gets gigs at Cantones playing as a sole review. After Mickey decides to confect a synth-pop chart buster for his next single release, rockabilly fan Dennis James drops out of the band. Hitman Records releases Video Lizards back with Cocktails for Two in August of 1982. By now, Mickey is doorman at Cantones. He gets invited to the 1983 WBCN Rumble, for which he enlists an all-female pickup band. After catching flack from assorted pinheads, he sours on the whole rock music scene and forms an organ combo which plays jazz, rhythm and blues, soul and blues. He releases the final Mickey Bliss band single, Groove Thang, back with Janine in 1984. That fall, Dennis James comes back to play guitar in what is now called the Mick Slick Combo, which disbands in the spring of 1985. 1984 was a heartbreak year. 1986 was a lost weekend. From 1987 to 1990, Mickey played organ for Big Train, which I happen to review in this very publication. I said they were too white bread then, and I say it now. Mickey got married in October of 1989. His incessant keyboard playing was giving his pulchritudinous enamorata the whim-whams, so for his 38th birthday she diplomatically presented him with a trumpet, which he practiced for a year. He then decided to blow his horn at some local jams, where he met the wrong hero, who tended door for a 10th-rate blues jam and regaled the ignorant peasants with his insanely unique and apparently incomprehensible stand-up routine. Why am I writing this article? I don't have to talk to you. I once played before a crowd of 10,000. Okay, so it was an ant farm. Puny humans, I come to tell you that your day is past. Soon, at my bidding, robots and computers will do all the work, and the rest of you will be thrown in jail to keep you out of trouble, including the, the pseudonymous Mr. Mickey Bliss. That was from The Noise of May 1996, issue number 150. The Partisan Review, Section, Comments. The Wrong Hero was one of the only survivors of his destroyed home planet, and that he had a big hand in annihilating everybody else on it seems to bother him not at all. This Zoganant comedian also considers himself a poet, playwright, novelist, composer, songwriter, essayist, critic, memoirist, writer of short fiction, writer of short humorous pieces, and journalist. Although indeed a comedian and critic, he was totally unknown outside of Boston and Providence, and known only to a few even in those communities. He is nothing special. PC World, Breaking News section. The new Pentium Pro will be distributed by Dell in the form of a desktop PC so simple to use that even a techno-illiterate like the wrong hero could master it, given an infinity of time, 
comparable to that necessary for a room full of chimps to type the collected works of William Shakespeare. Political Science and Politics The September Political Science Board meeting and luncheon was highly shambolic and rendered as even more so when a masked individual, soaked with sweat, burst into our office demanding any leftovers we were planning to throw away. And, just as quickly as he was able to loot the larders of our symposium, he vanished to our immense gratification. The Public Interest An old proverb, which has been updated for the 90s, states that when you tell a professional man that he works like a slave for peanuts, he laughs. But, when you call the wrong hero a slave, he glares at you. Then again, the wrong hero glares at you no matter what you do. Public Opinion Quarterly Title Black Law, the Methodology of the Bill of Wrongs and the Reliability of the Wrong Hero as a Source Provider Abstract Due to the extraordinary nature of his rantings, the wrong heroes claim to have discovered an earlier draft of the Bill of Rights which contradicts the formative basis of virtually every law on the books must be scrutinized carefully in order to satisfy certain weak-minded individuals who might be easily swayed by contrary-minded rhetoric and their logically and then logically disproved systematically and methodically beyond the shadow of a doubt. Reason Free Minds and Free Markets Section Balance Sheets Assets Libertarians need no better evidence that the system can be made to work in their favor than the example of the wrong hero whose long-running and long-winded cable access television series would in fact be highly controversial if anyone could be persuaded to watch it. Roll Call, the newspaper of Capitol Hill. As of December 1994, there were only three sure contenders for the 1996 presidential race. Incumbent Bill Clinton, Senate Majority Leader Bob Dole, and the wrong hero, a Cambridge, Massachusetts comedian who's never even been election, elect, elected dog catcher and who hopes on that basis to get the votes of appreciative pet lovers as well as folks who enjoy seeing packs of feral, hungry canines roam the streets. The wrong hero is, in fact, himself little removed from those very same feral, hungry canines which presumably roam the street. Science Magazine, the magazine of the American Association for the Advancement of Science. News and Comment Section. Although antibiotics have been around for decades, no one has found one efficacious in treating the pathogen known as the wrong hero. Scientific American It is ironic that we should be mentioning the wrong hero in Scientific American, because basically the wrong hero himself is little more than a superstitious caveman. The Spectator, Section, If Symptoms Persist, by Theodore Dalrymple. Every time I see a candy apple, says the wrong hero, a plug ugly galoot in an ill-fitting hat and moo-moo, I'm reminded of the thug who knocked my teeth in when I was a lad of six. I told him to get out of my office before I called the bodies. Der Spiegel. Seit fünf und setzig Jahren, der Unrecht Helden hat seine Mutter und Vater irritiert mit einem großen Mund und einer sehr schlimmer Weltanschauung. Translation. Since 1957, the wrong hero has his mother and father irritated with a big mouth and a very bad world view. Time Magazine, Section, Milestones. 
500th anniversary. By the time you this read the wrong hero, 500 programs for cable access produced will have a new record. Like this, ordinarily right, we do not, but insisted the hero wrong, or else us all destroy he would. Obeyed we so. The Utney Reader, the best of the alternative press. We have been most anxious to mention the wrong hero in these pages, but he has been reluctant to send us anything for fear of being labeled alternative and discriminated against on the basis of that stereotype in the highly unlikely event he should decide to go mainstream. In much the same way certain anarchists refuse to refer to themselves as anarchists for fear that such an action would be interpreted as authoritarian. The Washington Monthly, section Tilting at Windmills by Charles Peters. A man spends eight years of his life before the age of 40 busily attempting to become a cult figure. One by one, his friends desert him. His fiancée grows estranged from him as her biological clock ticks ever faster. His employers grow even more dissatisfied with his on-the-job performance. And overall, his reputation suffers more and more the more he persists in his mad chase for some form of fame. Does this sound familiar? It should, because although I could be speaking of virtually any politician or journalist, I am specifically referring to the wrong hero. U.S. News and World Report, Section Database. Most common literary device used by the wrong hero? Irony. Second most common, paradox or oxymoron. People who have seen the wrong hero perform live from 1990 to 1995? Approximately 800. People who have understood the wrong hero? Approximately 8. Duration of average wrong hero live set? 17 minutes of average wrong hero studio set, 55 minutes. Number of minutes which he has thus far exceeded his average studio set, 8 minutes. Longest wrong hero set ever, performed live, 90 minutes. Shortest, in studio, under 2 minutes, November of 95. Reason we're telling you all this? We don't know. Reason you're reading it? You tell us. The Weekly Standard, section, scrapbook. Title, Your Weekly Video Guide. From time to time, the staff of the Weekly Standard will be supplying you with lists of our favorite books. This week, we thought we'd mention some videos by fabulously obscure cult artist Kung performer, The Wrong Hero. Conspiracy Fact, 1996. The Wrong Hero gives you the lowdown on the real American history, the kind that stays sharp to the bottom of the glass. Suck My drug laced Nipples, Earth Filth, 1995. More than a libertarian manifesto, it is actually a complex and basically incoherent diatribe about the sorts of things most people would never even admit to their priests or rabbis, let alone to the world at large. The Wrong Hero Explains Everything and Nothing, 1992. The title says it all. Coming April 30th, 1996, The World Without an Earth Shall Be, The Wrong Hero's 100th feature-length broadcast, and by advance word, we hear that this two-hour magnum opus will probably be remembered as the wrong hero's masterpiece. World Link, the magazine of the World Economic Forum. Section from the editor. Although we're published in the United Kingdom, we like to keep our, our eye on up-and-coming trends in the colonies. The wrong hero is a typically obscure performance artist 
who will vary his routine somewhat over the course of the next three months. Over the next 10 weeks, he plans to show 10 feature-length films which will explore every aspect of the art of comedy. On April 30th, he will broadcast a two-hour feature film entitled The World Without an Earth Shall Be, in which he will tackle environmental issues head-on. On May 7th, he hopes to follow up with a feature-length film entitled 101 Damnations, in which he will gather up all his very best material from the last 10 years. Various live performance anthologies are scheduled to follow, including Live at Cafe Liberty, a collection of monologues compiled from his second Monday of the month performances at Cafe Liberty in Central Square, Cambridge, Massachusetts, United States of America. Although this editorial has basically been one long advertisement for the wrong hero, we ought to mention that we really don't like him very much. We just thought that you'd like to know what's going on in the world of avant-garde comedy. World Press Review. News and views from around the world. Section from the editor. Title, The Wrong Hero at 39, Midli Midlife Crisis or Premature Senility. In the 39 years since the wrong hero landed on this planet, he has gotten himself into one scrape after another. Yet, he has never come closer to overextending himself as he has in 1996, the year in which he committed himself to a brutal shooting schedule in which he will theoretically come up with from 10 to 50 hours of new material, a pace which no human being could possibly sustain. Fortunately, the wrong hero is an alien from outer space, of questionable intelligence, but indubitably prolific. Because he is a wholly unique entity, he can only compete against himself and his past accomplishments, such as they are, if in fact the word accomplishment is the proper one in describing his oeuvre to date. Perfection is not in the wrong hero's game plan, but he figures that if he keeps on doing what he's doing, sooner or later somebody will take notice and reward him for all his hard work. It is an advanced case of wishful thinking. But if he is powerless to make the world a better place, at least he has the satisfaction of stirring up trouble. And that's almost certainly what he'll end up accomplishing. Wish him luck. He needs it more than anyone we know. World Watch. Working for a Sustainable Future. Note to readers. For all his vulgarity and excess, I don't think of the wrong hero as someone to be ignored. Unfortunately, very few people share my belief. Over four years ago, The Wrong Hero released his first feature-length film. Since then, he has released 87 more, and this is number 89. In many ways, his message is hard to take, that life is a jest, that nothing is to be taken seriously, that American culture is a hospital in which they amputate your imagination, that committed consumers are committed only to consumption, that there's no way that the Chinese won't want to use up all the world's rice and gasoline, and there's no way the Western world will let them. On second thought, perhaps it is not his message which is so hard to take. Perhaps it is the self-righteous and hectoring way in which he presents it, which has caused some people to regard him as an intelligent fool whose advice must be taken with more than just a grain of salt. But remember, Prometheus himself could have saved himself a lot of trouble if he had stolen the fire from hell. But he chose to steal it from heaven, and all of us have benefited from his decision. Whether all of us have benefited from the wrong hero's decision to create these videos is something which remains to be seen. However, we hope 
and in working for a sustainable future, the wrong hero will decide that the answer is, in fact, yes. Nothing I can say in response to the charges made against me by the advocate that will not make me out to be the bad guy, somebody who despises minorities, which is far from being the case since, of course, I am actually a minority of one. But let me say this. Any special interest magazine which attempts to venture outside the bounds of its very severely constricted special interest ought to be careful when criticizing somebody who has made his career as being an outsider to the mainstream media. And that's all I have to say on that subject. The American Journalism Review has made the charge that I am guilty of wretched excess, but the only wretchedly excessive thing about the American Journalism Review ever since it changed its name from the Washington Journalism Review is the fact that so many of its articles are now incredibly boring, usually having to do with old fuddy-duddy has-been dinosaur newspaper men who nobody ever really cared about to begin with and who nobody certainly cares about now. As for the Amer magazine American Demographics, their ridiculous and absurd reliance on market research to come to their conclusions makes them so far from what the mainstream of what normal Americans are thinking, saying, and doing that it is virtually a crime that they are permitted to refer to their magazine as American Demographics, when in fact it should be called Readers of the Wall Street Journal Demographics parts 1 through 1,000. This, this public opinion survey research, which takes the place of actually going out and mingling with ordinary American people, is one of the most insidious factors in the degradation of American politics today. And it is magazines like American Demographics which contributes to this sad decline in the polity of this nation. The American Enterprise is, for the most part, a somewhat entertaining magazine, but the way they suck up to Republicans and conservatives in general is hardly the sign of a magazine interested in promoting an intellectual inquiry which strays much beyond the margins of narrow ideological circumscribed special interests. The American Prospect bills itself as a journal for the liberal imagination, but unfortunately, the bulk of the articles which appear in it display a very sad lack, not of liberalism, of which there are, it, it has an abundance, but of imagination, of which it has a paucity, to say the least. None of the articles I have ever read in the American Prospect have been worth more than a diligent scan, with only one or two exceptions. The American Spectator considers itself the self-styled enfant terrible, or whatever, however you say it, a terrible infant of American conservatism, but for the most part, the rhetoric is very suspiciously reminiscent of that of H.L. Mencken, who in fact had his glory years in the 1920s. 
which of course is typical. It typifies a magazine whose political viewpoints seem to belong in the era of Herbert Hoover. Their knee-jerk conservatism uh, gives me the opportunity to create a new phrase to counter the phrase knee-jerk American liberalism, which in fact um, the American prospect seems to traffic in quite egregiously. However, the sins of the American spectator are not merely those of knee-jerk conservatism, but downright knee-jerk naysaying and, and, and knee-jerk contrarianism and, and their, their shoddy reporting and, and their, their insistence on pandering not to the powerless, but to the people of wealth and power and attempting to cast them of, as the victims of the powerless is in fact little short of ludicrous, as is much of the overblown and overheated rhetoric which appears in this sad, sad magazine, which is basically merely a comic book for Pleistocene conservatism. Asia Week is amusing and entertaining at times, but only if you happen to be interested in Asian affairs, which it seems to have a um, veritable franchise on. Furthermore, it's been banned in Singapore because of nasty things that it has had to say about Singapore, which is to its credit, I must admit. But nevertheless, let's see if they even are any longer sold in Singapore. Yes, they are sold in Singapore. I suppose they have a special Singapore edition which, um, which uh, tries to uh, avoid criticizing public policy in Singapore, or perhaps not. This is, um, well, no, actually, I guess uh, I guess they do, in fact, have a Singapore edition now. Well, then I take back everything I said about my having a favorable view of their being barred in Singapore, since obviously they made the by no means painful compromise of merely deleting unfavorable commentary about Singapore. If the Atlantic Monthly were any more tedious, then I think you might have to call it something like the Sargasso Monthly, since much of what they have to say in their Journal of Opinion is in fact put in such a boring and academic manner that you would variably have to descend into a Sargasso of over-erudite vocabulary in order to wade your way through the average article in the Atlantic Monthly. To be sure, perhaps once a year they do publish an article which has profound impact upon policymakers. As a matter of fact, it seems as though much in the same way that politicians are now staging their messages to appeal not to the electorate but to reporters, the Atlantic Monthly is staging its messages not to appeal to its readership, which I'm sure is shrinking, but to public policymakers, in which case they could just as easily fire off a little, little newsletter that they send to people like Newt Gingrich and Bill Clinton every now and then, and avoid wasting all of that incredibly expensive, glossy paper. Business Week is an abomination. Basically, it worships at the shrine of selfishness, because, of course, as we all know, big business is the religion of selfishness. Actually, we don't all know that, but I believe that the folks at Business Week are probably well aware of that fact, which is why everything in it has a almost relentless pro-business stance about it, even when occasionally, in order to preserve their journalistic integrity, they do come out with exposés of unsavory business practices. For the most part, their coverage appears to be relentlessly and almost pig-headedly upbeat when it comes to business matters. Never, mo never once do they talk about how dangerous the coming corporatism which threatens to swamp the political and national developments in the world can be. So, to my mind, Business Week is basically just the devil's dictionary. Campaigns and elections in the guise of being a magazine about political strategy is actually a tip sheet for dirty tricks, or perhaps unintentionally, but somehow I find it difficult to believe that when they publish pictures of negative political ads with the accompanying text, they are not practically begging unscrupulous 
politicians to emulate these examples of political skullduggery. The Columbia Journalism Review is uh, regarded as a highly respected magazine, at least by the National Enquirer, in which, um, which uh, was recently the subject of a glowing appraisal by none other than the Columbia Journalism Review. Again, just like the American Journalism Review, a lot of the articles in this magazine are of only the most narrow interest and only two professional journalists who, as we all know, are far too busy to actually read anything, unless, of course, it has to do with shop talk about other journalists, which the Columbia Journalism Review specializes in, in many ways, much to its detriment. Its darts and laurels section is a presumptuous exercise in criticizing magazines with limited resources and, on the other hand, favoring publications which have larger and more substantial resources at their beck and call. If I may say a word in defense of journalists, quite uncharacteristically, as CJR well knows and has commented many times in the past, they are overworked and underpaid, and frequently their sins are a result of this very condition under which they are forced to work. So to have a column in which these journalists are criticized for the fact that they are overworked and underpaid seems to be just a little bit ungrateful, like biting the hand that feeds you. Of course, I never bite the hand that feeds me because I believe the meat is firmer and juicier further up the arm. Common Cause magazine has the right idea, but unfortunately it's such a thin magazine, there's so little real content to it other than the lead article and some little squibs and dribs and drabs here and there that I fear that it will never reach the position of prominence which perhaps it undoubtedly feels it deserves. Commentary has practically made a cottage industry of decrying anti-Semitism frequently in terms so strident that they constitute on their own a certain form of anti-anti-Semitism. Commonweal is, for the most part, a tedious, moribund magazine, which is appropriate considering that a lot of the time what they cover is the Vatican, which in fact is, in many respects, a tedious and moribund institution. Sorry to say. Consequences builds itself um, as a magazine which discusses the nature and implications of environmental change, but there is very little in it which leads me to suspect that we are so drastically in need of yet another environmental magazine that we should be willing to get a paid subscription to one which doesn't really have much different to say than any of the other magazines, notice, notably the, the environmentalist or environment, or even E. In fact, it's written in a style which is much denser than E, and yet not as scientifically comprehensive as the environmentalist. And so, in other words, it fits into only the most mediocre of niches when it comes to environmental magazines in general, of which I've read several. To Daedalus, I have only this to say. Who the hell even reads Daedalus anyway? I mean, yeah, sure, maybe you have a subscription base of uh, several thousand or so, who knows, but uh, of those, I think perhaps 99% just keep it on their coffee table to impress people, and I don't think anybody actually dips into this boring, thick clot of verbiage and actually reads it cover to cover, and if they do, they are very sick men, much sicker than myself, much sicker. I'm afraid that the far left-wing politics of dissent are little more than yet another exercise in contrarian tediousness. And I'd like to say right now that I myself believe in dissent, but that does not mean that I wish to subscribe to a magazine which 
attempts rather presumptuously to encapsulate dissent, and yet is written in such a boring fashion that it could be any one of a number of mainstream publications were it not for the fact that its views are in fact liberal. I like the idea behind Dollars and Cents a great deal, and it is a very admirable magazine in certain respects, and yet I wish that somehow the people who write for it would realize that if they expect anybody other than economists to read it, perhaps they should write it in a style which is in fact rather plain and drab instead of clotted with the type of econo-speak verbiage which makes virtually everybody's eyes glaze over, roll around in their sockets, and then fall out onto the tarmac. The drug policy letter is hardly on the cutting edge of um, magazine journalism. And as a matter of fact, um, it is a quite obscure policy letter, and therefore it is probably unfair of me to complain about the fact that its very narrow special interest focus renders it as little more than a response journal to the magazine High Times. The Ecologist is a thick, dense, and very high-minded publication. For that reason, it will probably never get the wider circulation which it undoubtedly deserves. Furthermore, the scientific terminology which clogs it like hairs clog a drain render it virtually unreadable to anybody who is not an environmental scientist or scientist or biologist, which is highly unfortunate. Perhaps they don't want to be famous and rich and spread their message to a wider audience, a message which desperately needs to be spread to such a wider audience. But anyway, I wish that, in fact, they were more widely disseminated. But you know, of course, if they were, um, it would involve not cutting down more trees necessarily, but using precious recyclable paper in order to have a print run which is larger than 5,000. And oh, 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 that would be a crime. We'd be wounding Mother Earth grievously, nay, irreparably. Well, this is going to make me sound like an asshole conservative, but E! Magazine is basically People Magazine for tree huggers. And why they should be devoting large articles to people for ethical treatment of animals in a magazine which supposedly concerns itself with broader environmental issues is beyond me. PETA has very little to do with ecological issues whatsoever. And furthermore, it's just part of this sort of sob sisterism that makes that gives environmentalists a bad name. All this talk of empathy. Well, why don't we talk about, say, uh, rationality or realism, and um, perhaps uh, discuss how we might address these pressing ecological problems through political action instead of having glitzy articles about the latest soy-based inks or the latest natural sponge that you can use to wash yourself instead of using the dreaded plastic, which we all know, of course, is the devil's stool and a, a cause of all the evil of the 20th century. The Economist, a magazine published in Great Britain, has this holier-than-thou style which would somehow lead you to suspect that Great Britain was, in fact, still the great world power that it once was when the magazine first started being published. However, that is so far from the fact that the elevated style of The Economist sometimes strikes one as so palpably ludicrous as to be enormously humorous. And quite unintentionally so, since I have never read anything in The Economist which is even remotely humorous, which has even so much as 
tempted me to crack a smile. Environment is a very fine magazine. As a matter of fact, the thing I like most about it is that nine times out of ten it takes less than 20 minutes to read and digest. Unfortunately, the problems that they discuss deserve more than 20 minutes time in which to read and digest them. Perhaps if they were to package what they had to say in a more palatable fashion, they would achieve a wider influence, which is much the same thing as I said about The Ecologist, but The Ecologist, of course, is basically a scientific journal, and Environment is more like a public policy journal. Well, the Far Eastern Economic Re Review has nice cartoons. Hey, maybe it's them that I was like uh, thinking about when I thought about how they don't publish it in Singapore anymore because no, they still publish it in Singapore, and you know what they, you know, you know about Singapore. They don't like anybody criticizing their regime. In fact, they will sue your pants off for libel if you deign to do so. So it looks like the Far Eastern Economic Review might very well still be publishing in Singapore. Although I think I might very well be mistaken about this. Um, but on the on the title on the uh, front page here, there's a big article: best headquarters. Hong Kong versus Singapore, with two lions facing each other. So maybe they're still sucking up to Singapore, I don't know. Well, as for uh, First Things magazine, any magazine which would print a lengthy article by the utterly loathsome and unscrupulous Midge Dector, just the very name alone, uh, I, I, I don't really have an awful lot more to say about it, regardless, uh, aside from that. Uh, of course, you know, these sorts of ad hominem attacks are hardly the epitome of rational debate tactics. However, it doesn't seem to me as though First Things follows that type of morality in the articles which it writes. And furthermore, the articles which aren't, in fact, mere thinly veiled ad hominem attacks tend to be incredibly dull polemics. Much like this. Well, next time you see Steve Forbes on the campaign trail, I guess um, you can uh, figure out exactly where all the money comes from. It is from the highly glitzy, glossy, and successful Forbes magazine, whose chief distinction seems to be that it is a slightly more colorful version of Fortune magazine, of which more seriatim. As for the Forbes media critic, it is a veritable hotbed of conservative thugs spouting off at incredibly dangerous length about things that they don't like about the so-called media liberal liberalism, which of course is a dangerous myth since most publishers are in fact staunch Republicans and have been since the Pleistocene era, which Forbes media critic seems to be still mired in in its short-sighted assessments of the so-called liberal media. Of this magazine, it might truly be said, in the words of Phil Oakes, that there but for fortune would go you or I. You or I. Basically, Fortune magazine appears to me to be a, a sort of cheat sheet for unscrupulous fat cat businessmen to downsize their corporations, throwing thousands of people out of work while at the same time fattening their own salaries with generous pension plans and, and, and yearly salaries in excess of $1 million. You know, an interesting fact, the, um, the discrepancy between the uh, worker and the factory owner has grown tenfold over the last 40 years. And in no small part, this is due to the fine work done by the folks at Fortune magazine. Freedom Review uses is its ideological stance of being on the side of the angels to essentially crank out articles which nobody but a public policy wonk would even want to look at, let alone read in their entirety. Perhaps they should come out with a companion magazine called Freedom from Boredom Review. The Futurist is sort of like popular mechanics for, for these incredibly kooky people who uh, 
or think Heidi and, and Al, Alan Toffler are like the, the avant-garde of uh, American literature. And, and I don't know, there's just something about it which is distasteful. The, the authoritarian, technocratic stance that they take on so many topics, the fact that they get all of these incredibly boring bigwigs who've spent their entire life basically putting other people down and, and ah, yeah. you know, it's an inter it's like a comic book or something and it's it's like uh, you can't really rely on anything it has to say about the future since of course given its nature it's been proven wrong time and time again Gallup poll monthly this is great, a magazine which makes its bread and butter the timely forecasting of breaking trends comes out monthly and has a lead time of what seems to be approximately three months so that by the time it comes out the trend that it is supposedly giving you the survey opinion polls concerning has come and gone. Well, interesting, a magazine which, which publishes its own obsolescent surveys. Very, very interesting notion. Well, Harper's has its index, which is to its credit, and it's, which is syndicated, and um, it also has those little squibs and dribs and drabs. It's sort of like a very, very upscale Utney reader, although, of course, it precedes Utney reader. Um, and I must say that over the past 15 years, it, is, it has become immensely more readable. But on the other hand, I can find time and time again that I would rather, I would just as soon skip three quarters of what is printed in the magazine. So in its guise as a magazine which appeals to intelligent and inquiring minds everywhere in every single page of its great pronouncements, um, it falls somewhat short. And uh, the guy that writes for them, Lewis Lapham, I don't know, I used to like him a lot, but uh, Lately, it seems, he's just like chewing over the same old dog meat over and over again. You know, I don't know. I mean, I have one of his books, and I suppose I shouldn't come down on him until I've read it, but uh, that's the way it seems to me, anyhow. You know, the Harris Poll, and it actually comes out on a daily basis or as needed, so presumably it has up-to-the-minute breaking news about incredibly important topics. Topics like this example, Tim Allen, still America's favorite TV personality. You know, I was going to invest my money in, in bonds and take it out of stocks, but then I read the Harris Poll, and it told me the incredibly important information that Tim Allen was still America's favorite TV personality. So that made me decide to keep all my money in stocks because I figured the stock market is just bound to go up and up and up and up if such a smiling fellow like Tim Allen is still America's favorite TV personality. This was incredibly important policy news that I really needed to know. And I'd be virtually helpless in the open market if, in fact, I didn't have some inkling, at least, not of what America's economic indicators are, but that Tim Allen is still America's favorite TV personality. Oh, my God. What would I do without this incredibly insightful and valuable knowledge, Harris Poll? Thank you, Lou Harris, wherever you are. Harvard Magazine. What can you say about a magazine that panders to all of the in instincts, uh, the, uh, all of the self-aggrandizing instincts of the alumni of the most self-aggrandizing college in the known universe? I'm surprised they don't try to claim that Benjamin Franklin was in fact a Harvard graduate, only we didn't know it. Well, Hispanic Magazine, yet another one of those special interest magazines that takes a look at the world through tortilla-colored glasses and virtually ignores everything else. Not only that, but they can't even sell the magazine. In fact, they have a hard time giving it away. I've seen it like at various places around Cambridge, and people just leave it there. So that's a heartening display of its uh, wide-reaching influence that it cannot even be given away. You know, Human Events newspaper, the uh, National Conservative Weekly, is so right-wing, it makes the folks over at the Washington Times look like veritable pussycats by way of comparison. I'm, I'm constantly tempted to write in inhuman events on the front of it because basically its, its mindset is basically anti-life. It is 
inhuman, and being somewhat inhuman myself, I think I'm in a position to know. Well, In These Times is another laudable magazine, but aside from its, um, its bi-weekly uh, little squib articles, it's not really a very easy magazine to read. Um, most of the feature articles are just plain, the I don't know, kind of blah. And I've actually read in this magazine, as opposed to others, things which were just plain, palpably not so. Most magazines have fact-checking departments, and they uh, try to convey an, an aura of knowingness, if not in fact, um, you know, a grim determination to check every single one of its facts. In these times, does not always live up to that high-minded purpose. I am very sorry to say. And if I hear one more article about labor labor organizers, I think I will scream. Please write about more important things. Thank you. I notice that the readers of India Today in the library never put it back where it belongs, which tells you something, I think, about the social structure of India. Not that I've ever really taken the time to read India Today in its entirety, but anyway, I thought you'd like to know that the people who borrow it never put it back, and that really makes me mad. Well, obviously, JAMA is a highly respected magazine, and there's very little negative I can say about it since I, am not, I do not have the medical training or the training in biology to comment intelligently upon its content. But I will say this, that every time I see the magazine, I want to quote from the words of the old Otis Redding song and shout JAMALAMA! Well, I hate to say this about our friends to the north, but uh, McLean's um, Canada's weekly, nucle new, yeah, weekly news magazine, you know, everything about Canada is intrinsically boring and mediocre, and this magazine certainly is no exception to that rather um, prejudicial dicta, however, dictum, but however. It's funny how the Media Studies Journal, which studies something as lively as the media, should itself be so unmediagenic as to be virtually unreadable. Isn't that just the way? Mother Jones somehow has never struck me as a serious magazine of great consequence. Um, well, first of all, it's a monthly, and it's unfair to compare it with the news weeklies like Newsweek or Time, or even U.S. News and World Report, but I frequently find much more in one weekly issue of the prominent news weeklies than I ever find in one rather thick and substantial issue of Mother Jones. Most of their lead articles are simply not worth taking the time to read, because they very often have very few insights to to add to the general discourse, unlike journals like The Atlantic and Harper's, which occasionally do come out with something which is in fact worth reading from beginning to end. I think the nation might have a problem with its self-image. I mean, it's printed on this really crummy paper as if to say, well, we choose to be among our brothers, the poor. and." Um, they just, like, it, it seems as though they just don't want to take the trouble to like bother making themselves more attractive. They have been pushing the magazine more, which is to their credit, since the only place around here that I was able to ever find it was some communist bookstore in Jamaica Plain. But uh, I don't know. They, they do have some good writers working for them, but um, Alexander Cockburn virtually defines the term contrarian, since Everything he says seems to be little more than a fizzing bomb thrown into the maw of the collective unconscious, and he seems to be waiting gleefully, rubbing his hands together like a fly cleaning itself for it to explode. Such as, um, oh, and Christopher Hitchin is much the same way as his latest expose of that dangerous felon, Mother Teresa, bears mute testimony. National Minority Politics right-wing minority members. Great. What are they going to do? Outlaw legislation favoring themselves? Why don't they just go the whole hog and outlaw themselves? 
Well, at least National Review has the courage of its convictions. But, well, you know, you could say that about a lot of people like, oh, Napoleon, say, or Stalin. So I'm not quite sure that's such a great thing. And they're constantly nitpicking about, you know, the inconsistencies of, of liberal beliefs. But never once do they bother pointing out that perhaps conservatives occasionally have beliefs which could be nitpicked to death as well. Like, for example, the conservative belief that Phil Graham is even a viable candidate for president. This is a representative cover from the magazine The New Democrat. Hardly an attractive inducement for you to, like, feverishly snatch the magazine from the newsstands and thumb through its pages in search of fascinating articles. For example, Rebuilding the Democratic Coalition by Al Fromm, or, or the, uh, the page turner, the mind-bendingly interesting Rethinking Social Security by Robert J. Shapiro. And of course, oh, who could resist, soon to be a Hollywood feature film, the article Rediscovering Liberalism's Lost Tradition by Fred Siegel and Will Marshall. Oh boy, oh boy, I can't wait. The new leader is actually quite a find. Its poetry section by Phoebe Pettengill and its theater reviews by Stephen Camper are actually very, very fine and worthy of publication in a larger periodical. But the problem with the new leader is it always comes in like three months late. By the time you get it, you know, the, the news that they're supposedly commenting on is no longer really news at all. And it's not even, you know, it's already gone to the stage where even the quarterly journals of opinion have already treated it. So, new leader, try to get a better mailing system, won't you? NPQ, big, glossy magazine full of big, virtually unreadable articles in type so small you can barely wade through it even if you were interested in what NPQ Big Glossy Magazine had to say. The New Republic. What can you say about the New Republic? Well, the New Republic is basically a comic book for policy wonks and that's the long and the short of it. Well, New Statesman and Society is not a magazine that many Americans take the time to read, which is a good thing because if it were more widely circulated in America, I guess then half the magazine would have to be left out because most of it is about boring Labor Party politics in Great Britain, and every other issue talks about the already incredibly tiresome to me individual named Tony Blair. Only in Great Britain would a man with a name like Tony Blair have articles written about him every other week. Please, no. Bef I mean, three years, four years ago, it was Neil Kinnock. And now it's Tony Blair. Well, Newsweek is okay. It's Conventional Wisdom Watch is the first thing I turn to when I pick up any one of the three news weeklies currently available to us Americans. But so often they seem to take their lead from more impressive policy journals, which they aren't any too scrupulous about citing in their bulk of their articles. And of course, in turn, the, um, the, the uh, television news takes many of its leads from magazines like Newsweek without bothering to mention that the reason this is news is because there was just an article about it in Newsweek, a weekly news magazine with a lead time of anywhere from five days to several weeks. The writers at the New York Review of Books remind me an awful lot of children seriously playing with mud pies and then just as seriously attempting to sell them and even more seriously hoping to get a certain amount of money for the sale thereof, even though basically what they are selling are, in fact, mud pies, which if you were to try to eat them, unless you were a pregnant woman with the medical condition known as pica or paisa or pica, uh, you would find them virtually indigestible unless you had a special interest in the particular mud pie being peddled that particular time. The New York Times Book Review is so relentlessly upbeat so much of the time, although they have been attempting to remedy that lately, that what it has to say is um, very difficult to give any great credence to. 
And the thing about them is, you know, they'll be really incredibly upbeat, and then in order to show off his erudition, the reviewer will say, it is unfortunate that the person who wrote this article made several easily corrected mistakes, which we hope will be corrected in a subsequent edition. You know, I mean, it's practically, they ought to have that phrase in stereotype, you're ready to go, because it is in virtually every review of any incredibly well-regarded scholarly book that they publish a uh, review of. Of all the magazines published by Sunday newspapers, the New York Times magazine is probably the one most worth reading. That, however, does not mean that it is, in fact, always, or even most of the time, worth reading. I certainly do not. I have more important things to do with my time than read the glissy, glossy, glossy advertisements in the gussied up New York Times magazine section. Thank you. Ah, yes, the New Yorker, the pride of Manhattan, published, of course, by an Englishwoman who, in the last few years, has tried to give it a more contemporary, up-tempo, upbeat type of uh, look and format. And, and, you know, the articles are now um, a little more like the cutting edge of 1988 instead of the cutting edge of 1948, and that's all to the good. And they do publish the work of underground cartoonists who, 30 years ago, were begging for crusts and cans of beans and drinking near beer and, and, and champagne at migrant work camps in, uh, just south of the border from the California border. But anyway, anyway, the New Yorker, well, it's come up in the world, but of course it's lost a certain aura of gravitas in consistently pandering to things which are merely novel but which have no lasting value, which the old New Yorker it, for, to its credit, occasionally did, in fact, um, cover things of lasting value. So, anyway, so much for the New Yorker. I'm not going to say anything more about them because I'm going to be publishing them someday, I hope. Partisan Review. Man, this magazine is a real snore -thon. I'm telling you. And it's almost thick enough to use as a pillow, too, so that comes in very handy. Believe you me. Well, PC World. Well, it's not going to put Wired out of business anytime soon, and I'll tell you that much. And there's another magazine, too, called, I don't know, PC Planet or something like that. Too bad it doesn't refer to the political correctness so obviously and often deplored by conservative radio commentators. Then, at least, it might be controversial. Instead, it's just the in-house magazine for computer nerds. I mean, what more can you say? Of course, you know, those guys are going to be running the world if they aren't already, so maybe I should start reading it a little more diligently than I do, which, of course, is not diligently at all. In fact, I don't think I've ever even so much as opened the cover and looked inside of it, except maybe once. Political Science and Politics, or as it's known, P.S. P.S. I loathe you. Again, it is one of those peculiar ironies that this magazine, which is called The Public Interest, should, in fact, in content and format, be so intrinsically uninteresting. Sorry to say. Well, and now here's the scintillating Public Opinion Quarterly, with articles like Oh, reverse context effects in mail surveys. Uh, you know, with, it's, with titles like that, with snazzy little taglines and, and, and whatnot, you, you can tell that uh, the POQ is going to really take over the magazine world someday. I've always thought this magazine should have a companion magazine entitled Treason. Its anti-big government stance is monotonous and tedious and Worst of all, predictable. Science, prestigious, boring. Scientific American, somewhat less prestigious, every bit as boring. The Spectator, a magazine for Tories, a magazine on the cutting edge of the 90s. Unfortunately, for the most part, that still means the 1890s. Spiegel, Octo Lieber, such a serious magazine, and nine times out of ten it has a picture of some incredibly luscious looking underage naked gal, either on the cover or in the text. Here's what I have to say to Der Spiegel. Meinst du das oder sagst du das nur so? Do you mean that or are you only saying that? Uh, Time Magazine. I've often wished that 
somebody would publish a version of Time Magazine for children called something like, oh, I don't know, Tim Magazine. Just a thought. Or maybe even the anti-Time Magazine, Emit Magazine, which would have unbiased coverage and would not pander to the movers and shakers of the American polity. The Utney Reader. With a hard charge and name like that, you just know that someday they're going to be on everybody's coffee table. The Washington Monthly. You know, I actually like them. They're really quite good. Um, Charles Peters writes these incredibly lengthy and occasionally dotty and old-fashioned editorials to begin each issue, but nevertheless, it is a very worthwhile publication and a pity that more Washington policymakers don't read it, as they never tire of reminding us virtually every issue. It's one of the few magazines which seems to be predicated on the premise that if only everybody in Washington read us, there would be no need for to publish this magazine anymore, but they don't, so we will continue until such time as they do begin to read us every month faithfully and religiously, except in January and February when we only publish one issue. U.S. News and World Report, or U.S. Snooze and World Report. And let me tell you something, their editor-in-chief, he writes these editorials, Mort Zuckerman, he has got to go. He is so, so far out, man. Well, the Weekly Standard, one of the newest additions to this lineup. And I like them because they promote a new standard of standardness, which is really fun. Worldlink, big glossy magazine. Suggestion, spend more time on editing to make it readable and less time on glossy format. World Press Review, just what the world needs, and all a putrida of half-baked opinions from members of the crackpot world press who nine times out of ten don't know what they're talking about if to judge their American coverage is any indication. Finally, World Watch, a fine magazine, and once again, if only, if only they spent a little more time editing and a little less time doing research, then they could be just as good as e-magazine, maybe. I am the wrong hero. This has been Anti-Hero. Time is short, so I barely have enough time to say that you are tuned to Cafe Cafe.